As we listen to these things, I want us to be listening through the lens of how our relationships are with our siblings. Our parents. Our adult children, if we are of the age. Our spouses. The beginning of the Gospel starts, this man welcomes sinners. He even eats with them. For the Jewish people to break bread at the table was the sign of great intimacy. When people broke bread together, everything that kept folks apart left and they were back united at the table. That's why coming to communion is so important. So many of us keep ourselves away from the table. It's a sign of unity. Jesus ate with the sinners. He ate with the rip-off artists, the tax collectors. And the professional religious people, the Pharisees and the scribes, didn't get it. No, you have to go through life just the right way, fall in line, do these things, and then you are admissible. You can come to the table. And my thinking is, why would we keep ourselves away from the table, from being fed by the one who wants to nourish and feed us, whether we're close by, following the rules and having a, a nice, neat, perfect life, or if our life is a you-know-what show, if it's in shambles and things aren't going well, like we saw in the characters in today's Gospel. Why do we keep ourselves from communing with the one who wants to commune with us? You with me? That is not saying anything goes. I want to be very clear about that. I am not saying anything goes. I'm presupposing we take an honest look inside. We sit with ourselves, don't we? We know our own stuff. We know where things are not right. We know where things are going down a, a bad path. But I think it's precisely in that place that we need God's grace, we need God's presence, we need God's compassion, understanding, and love to love us back like we saw in today's gospel to get back on track. And we don't need a punitive, finger-pointing, judging, judgmental, punishing presence. Once again, that does not mean anything goes. Today is about love and grace, compassion and understanding, in an effort to bring people back together. Now, as we think about this in light of our siblings and our friends, our spouses, our parents, our kids, all the people with whom there may be some rupture in a relationship, big or small, it gets a little more difficult to let these words sink in and then propel us to some healing, reconciling action. Because whether we're the older sibling or not, if we're right, we're right. And we know they've done wrong. And who the heck wants to be so generous with somebody who is not pulling their weight or doing the right thing. I don't. Don't let the pink robes fool you. I don't. I would say most of us don't. It's too hard to get, get to that place. That's for God. But yet today, we're being challenged and invited to really look at this and do something about it. God's showing us a different way to be to be more broad, more generous, more gracious than our rational, tit-for-tat minds think. So Alice Walker, in her book, We Are the Ones We Have Been Waiting For, tells a story of a group of people known as the people of Bemba. They're somewhere in Zambia and on the northern borders of South Africa. The Bemba believe that every human being, every single human being, capable of doing a million gazillion different things, good and bad, but every human being who comes into the world is good. 
and that every person's deepest desire is for safety, for love, for peace, and for happiness. Now, when someone from the Bemba people acts unjustly, or as we saw in the gospel today, irresponsibly, that person is not punished, but that person is required to stand in the center of the village alone and unrestrained. And then all the other members of the Bemba people are called together, the community is called together, and they gather in a large circle around the one who has been accused of some irresponsibility or some wrongdoing. And then, every person gathered around the accused begins to speak. And they recall all the good things that the accused person has done throughout the course of his or her lifetime. Many good deeds are mentioned, and they're mentioned in detail. All of the accused's positive attributes, their strengths, their kindnesses, and their efforts on behalf of the common good are carefully recited by the different members of the community. And then when everybody has spoken on the behalf of the accused, all the members of the Bemba break their circle and then a joyous celebration takes place. The one who had committed the injustice or behaved badly is now welcomed back into the community and given a fresh start. The past deeds are now forgotten as celebration and reconciliation intersect. And the Bemba people are now stronger, more unified because of this ritual and their focus on the positive aspects of the person instead of the negative. Their response, instead of a punitive one, supports the integrity of the whole community in the face of a difficult situation. And the person has the opportunity to begin to take responsibility. I've read that through three or four times. And I wasn't going to use the story to illustrate anything because I'm not there. You with me? It's too light. It's too easy. It's no guarantee that, that person's going to take responsibility. What do they just get off scot free? I'm just telling you, this is what, what came up in me. And so I was like, not a helpful hint for the homily today. And then at some point, and I went to bed early last night, and God, it's amazing what sleep does. It's amazing how the spirit infiltrates, right? I got up this morning and I reread it, and I still cast it off. And then I thought to myself, if there's some resistance in you, John, that's the pay dirt place. What is it? I am, literally and figuratively, the older brother. Who else is an older sibling in here? <laughs> Can you relate with the poor older daughter today, huh? Huh? I remember when we were little, I would get, I'd get in trouble. They had this thing called a strap, but that's a whole other thing to talk about. We don't do this today, huh? No, we get, I'd get in trouble, you know, and then by the time my younger brother Paul was uh, in line, he used to get away with what? Everything. He'd get away with everything, huh? And we used to be like, oh, we never would have got away with this, you know? I did things the right way. <laughs> the older sibling, whether we're in that actual birth order or not, is in every single one of us. Once again, if we don't have it, is it anarchy? 
Do we just throw out all the rules? But God is saying, no, don't throw out the rules, but see them for what they are. They are not it. What is it? Is compassion, understanding, patience, generosity. You know what's so egregious about this gospel? That older sibling was actually entitled to two-thirds of the inheritance, and yet the parent cuts it in half. Further salt in the wound, two-thirds gets cut to a half. And then secondly, when the younger sibling, the prodigal, asks for the inheritance, basically, that child is saying, Mom, Dad, you're dead to me. Because inheritances usually come one after, right? Somebody passes. It was so insulting. Jesus uses this gospel to really highlight the pain that somebody felt from another person hurting us. Again, what's the pain that's going on in your family or mine, in our lives, in our relationships? It was so painful, so egregious, so disrespectful, so hurtful, and yet see how the parent reacts. Before the, the prodigal was even close to home, from a long distance, it says, the parents caught sight of the turnaround and that's what God is interested in. Are you and I? I think we'll still hold each other to a high and tough standard, even if sometimes people say that they are sorry, even if people ask for forgiveness in our families, in our relationship. We're tough with each other. Maybe we're tough with ourselves. But God is saying, there's a new way. Paul says in that second reading, God is always about reconciling the world to himself. He wants us to be together. My father used to say, my mother said, your brothers, stick together. As our parents age, all they want is to see us as the adult siblings as best as we can be together. It says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Jesus, not counting their trespasses against them. I'm a bean counter when it comes to that. Are you at times? We count these things. We remember these things. But God doesn't count the trespasses, and he entrusts to each one of us in 2019 the message of reconciliation. And then Paul says, so you and I are ambassadors for Christ, just as if God is appealing through us. We are called to spread this message. It's an all-embracing love. And it can potentially, like in the Bemba example, move the person who goes astray and does the wrong thing to take responsibility. And not because they were punished, but because they were what? Loved. Loved. Because they were shown compassion. It's risky. I don't know if I'm willing to. I'm talking to myself right now. I'm just telling you this right now. It's risky business, isn't it? Feels it anyway. It is the way to go. It's a way of being. It's an attitude. The father's compassion, the mother's compassion in all of our lives. Think of how many times our parents may have been compassionate and understanding toward us in ways that we didn't even know at the time. And now this next generation comes and we are invited and given the opportunity to be this way with each other. That compassion leads to the change of heart. So this week, I leave us with a couple of thoughts in our own families, in the way that we relate with each other, with all the resolved or unresolved ruptures that have taken place. Number one, do we stay stuck in the ruptures or are we interested in the repairs. Relationships are about rupture and repair, rupture and repair all the time. Are we stuck in the ruptures or are we interested in the repairs? Number two, where are you and I resentful of a family member or a friend or even somebody who's different from us? who got the fattened calf and the rings and the robes, who got in in a different way, where are you and I resentful of somebody who might be different? 
Where might you and I have that older sibling residing within us, even if we're the youngest in the birth order? And then second, just to broaden this in light of our country, in our world, our church, as we look at groups who often show great disdain toward each other, I'm thinking the Republicans and the Democrats, the liberals and the conservatives, the Trump supporters and the Trump haters, the blacks, the whites, the browns, the straight, the gay, the rich, the poor, the undocumented, the legal citizens, the weak, the strong. How can we, mid-Lent, begin to reconcile our own thoughts and ways of thinking with these issues and these groups? How do we reconcile our own words, ideas, and actions? And remember that God, the parent in this gospel, had two children. Both had different views of life and the world. And God loved them both immensely. How do we model that in 2019? It's challenging, very challenging.